Kronos Audio Books presents Contract Killer by William Hoffman and Lake Headley. Read for you by Joseph Campanella with a special interview with Donald Tony the Greek Francos from Attica. How would you like to find Jimmy Hoffa? Opened a February 1989 phone call from Bill Helmer, senior editor of Playboy magazine. Las Vegas private investigator Lake Headley, once called the best PI in the world, leaned back, grinned, and waited for the punchline. Instead, Helmer continued in a serious vein, saying Playboy had received calls from a federally protected witness, identifying himself only as D.F., who claimed to know who murdered Hoffa, why, and where the body was buried. We'd like you to check it out, said Helmer, him and his story. Where is he? We don't know, but we hope to find out. By answering yes, when an operator asked, would you accept a collect call from DF in a federal correction facility, the private detective took the first step along a path that led him through the most bizarre, certainly the most important investigation of his 30 plus year career. Headley learned that D.F. had dictated 14 cassette tapes detailing his life in organized crime and the witness protection program. I made these tapes, Donald Francos told Headley, because I might be here one day and gone tomorrow. They could take me outside, shoot me, and claim I was trying to escape. I know. It's been done before. After their first lengthy conversation, Headley wanted to learn more, to talk in person with the government witness who was protected to the extent of total isolation in a desolate part of the country without visiting privileges for family or friends. D.F. called at least twice a day for the next several weeks, conversations never lasting less than 40 minutes. He gave Headley his name, Donald Gus Francos, and his location, the Federal Correctional Facility at Sandstone, Minnesota. But the government resisted the meeting as long as possible. It took a month of frustrating, seemingly nonstop phone calls to penal system bureaucrats in New York and Washington, D.C., before Headley received a go-ahead for what he believes is an unprecedented instance of a private investigator or author obtaining face-to-face -face interviews with a federal witness held in custody. In early April 1989, at the remote federal prison in Sandstone, Minnesota, Headley was led through a maze of silent corridors and clanging steel doors to a meeting room. Clear the halls, someone yelled. A few minutes later, the same voice boomed, okay, bring him down. This hall clearing episode demonstrated what Francos had been saying, that he was protected even from chance encounters with other inmates. The door opened. In stepped a handsome, neatly dressed man with graying temples around a balding crown. He made a brisk approach, stuck out his right hand, and said, you got to be late. Glad to meet you. I'm Donald Francos. That is, in here I am. On the street, I'm Tony the Greek. Francos spoke freely and venomously about the Federal Witness Protection Program, the people in it, rats like myself, and the people who run it. All my life I've hated rats, he said. I can't believe I became one. That bothers me more than any other thing I've ever done in my life. I guess I'm sorry for all the guys I killed, but for the most part, they were scumbags. Now, John Gotti's offered $300,000 to anyone who hits the Greek. Gotti was my friend. I was the last person anyone thought would rat. It was true. Those were the exact words former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark used. The last person anyone thought would rat when he heard Franco's had turned. Author William Hoffman, 36 nonfiction books to his credit, first talked to Donald Francos in May 1989. That was the beginning of an estimated 700 telephone conversations between Francos and Hoffman. Headley and Hoffman, working together and separately, attempted to verify everything that could be verified. They talked to cops, federal agents, journalists who specialized in the mafia, New York City detectives, even Francos's former cellmates. Confirmation of what Franco said piled upon confirmation. Clearest of all was that inside prison and out, Franco's had been an unholy terror, a feared and most dangerous man. Amazingly, he knew almost everyone in the New York underworld, and they all knew him. It should be borne in mind that for years, Donald Franco's has been, and still is, the federal government's witness. 
Witness Protection Program officials believed him long before Headley and Hoffman checked out his astounding revelations and became convinced of their veracity. The result is this narrative of chilling, bloody crimes committed for and with some of the nation's most notorious gangsters. Why would Franco's reveal numerous incidents in his life that portray him as a cold-blooded killer for hire and even worse? Why would he want these crimes to appear in print? The answer is that he has spent a lot of time thinking about his career, which he believes has been remarkable. True, though the public will surely view it from the perspective of horror, not as the grand adventure Frankos remembers. And he does not want this epic, his word, to die with him. The authors have attempted to capture Frankos' true voice, using the killer's own words whenever possible. Frankos usually speaks in the language of an intelligent, well-read individual, which he is. But on occasion, when describing a crime or a particularly horrible prison experience, he reverts to the rawest language of the street. When this happens, he transforms in an eye blink from cheerful next door neighbor into a man who has killed, killed often, and enjoys remembering out loud. The phone rang early on this summer, 1973, after Nolan in New York, and right away I recognized the gruff voice of John Sullivan, an important Irish mobster and a contract killer for Genovese crime family boss, Frank Tony Salerno. You free today? Sullivan asked. Yeah, I said. Made me a wolf's jelly in an hour. Sullivan waited for me at a corner table. He'd started his lunch. About 5'10 and blocky in his late 40s, John never smiled, never lightened up. I need you for a job, he said. He didn't fool around much, the call of it to my liking. Who, I asked. Buster De Laval. I know Buster. Makes no difference. Right, I said. So you'll do it? Yeah. I took pride in giving definite answers. No maybes or I'll think it over. John Sullivan ordered a slice of cheesecake and a cup of coffee. Whether planning it or committing it, murder made him hungry. You gotta be careful with this guy, John said. He always packs a pistol. Right, I said. I'd done time with the Laval at Denimora. I knew him as a dangerous character. Fat Tony don't want no delays. This Buster situation's been agitating him for a long time. Sullivan handed me a package. That's half, he said. When I later opened it at my apartment, I found $5,000, which meant, with Sullivan keeping 50% for himself, this was a $20,000 contract. Big money for a hit. Often a crime boss paid an independent hitter like me $5,000 total or less. Sometimes he wanted it done for nothing. And I obliged, a professional courtesy, so to speak, to open up other avenues of making money. The heat's on, Sullivan concluded, getting up from his chair. Don't make no mistakes. The next morning, I carefully prepared for the kill. I spread a yellow-tinted makeup on my face and neck, stuffed cotton balls inside my cheeks, and donned a medium air for a wig. Next, I placed a sawed-off shotgun in a large hollowed-out radio I intended to carry. I was ready to hunt for Mr. John Buster de Laval. I went to see a friend who owned a vegetable store near 12th Avenue, which served as a repository for a wide variety of stolen goods. When I walked in, my friend didn't recognize me. Good. I greeted my friend, told him I once again wanted to use the back of his store to chop up a body, then handed him a thousand dollars, the agreed upon price. He didn't want to hear a name, and I didn't give one. I already had everything in my stolen Buick with the phony plates, twenty large black garbage bags, surgeon's gloves, chainsaw, and goggles to shield my eyes. I knew there would be a mop and a bucket in the vegetable store. On my second trip to Lafayette Street, De Laval's turf, I spotted him. There sat Buster, stationed in a booth in a Greek restaurant, with his back against the wall, gazing at the door. I double-parked the car just out of sight and stepped onto the street. That's when I felt a nervous spasm in the pit of my stomach. It always happened this way when I went after another killer, when I knew it would be his life or mine, no other result possible. Then another feeling, only present when I went to kill someone who might kill me, a powerful wish to be back in the protection of my mother's arms. The desire then vanished as suddenly as it appeared. The time had come. I entered the restaurant 